All right, well, welcome to today's live webinar, Avoid Email Fraud in the Vendor Process. Uh, 20 tips in 20 minutes. I'm gonna try to have five minutes on either side for introductions and kind of explaining how I got to this webinar and then also some time at the end for your questions. Now, before we get started, some housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording within three days, but most likely it'll be tomorrow. Um, feel free to submit your questions anytime. They will be saved for the Q&A session. And if I don't get to all of them, I will answer them via email within 24 hours. And then don't forget to download a PDF of the presentation. And I also have my uh, brochure for more trainings and resources um, in the handout section. Now, a little bit about me before we get started. I am Deborah Richardson. You may have heard of me by my saying, putting the AP in happy. That is also uh, the name of my podcast. Now, as a previous AP Senior Manager of Global Vendor Maintenance, I was responsible for a team of 17 processing over 2,000 vendor requests per month and uh, maintaining 140,000 active global vendors vendor records across seven different ERPs. Now, along with the payroll manager, since that was the other area where cyber criminals were um, applying social engineering tactics, we implemented over 70 internal controls and best practices to mitigate fraud for our AP and payroll teams. I now work with AP vendor teams that are still fully or partially manual to add authentication techniques, internal controls, and and best practices that eliminate fraud, regulatory fines, and bad vendor data. All right, so let's take a look at the agenda. Um, we will open this up um, looking at how cyber criminals are evolving in your email. And then we'll start the 20 tips in 20 minutes for avoiding email fraud in the vendor process with tips for three different types of email fraud. Um, tips to avoid business email compromise, then tips to avoid gift card scams, and then tips to avoid credential theft. And I want to do that in 20 minutes or so, leaving time uh, for questions. All right, so I recently had a guest on my podcast, episode 151, talking about email security, and he said that controls that your security team or IT team put into place stop about 85% of fraudulent emails. And I am sure that you have processes in place that you use to deal with the other 15% that actually make it through. And those processes are put into place to avoid business email compromise scams, gift cards, uh, scams, and credential theft. And why am I really focusing on those three? That's because business uh, uh, cyber criminals are evolving and they make the avoidance of these scams harder. And so let's look at that. So the first um, process that you most likely have in place um, is checking the email domain. So you probably check for those extra letters, those subtle misspellings, but it's not even about that anymore. Fraudsters or cyber criminals are using a play on letters, a capital I for lowercase l or a, w, a double V for a W. So it makes it harder for you um, to spot that fraud or a cyber criminal trying to perpetrate a business email compromise scam. Um, the next one is, do you know if that email requesting a gift card is really from your boss? So I bet most everyone here has an external email indicator that uh, comes in your inbox. Well, if you haven't heard, cyber criminals can use CSS and HTML coding to remove that external email indicator. So now you don't know if that really is your boss sending you that request or gift cards, um, if you're only relying on the lack of an external email indicator. So this is a big issue if you're trying to avoid gift card scams. And then lastly, you know, are you entering your credentials into a fraudulent website? Well, remember when that padlock on the address bar indicated that the site was safe? 
not anymore. Security um, Boulevard reported in 2019 that more than half of all fishing sites had that padlock um, indicating that the site was secure. Now, this is a huge issue since you need to avoid credential theft. Now, if you're an accounts payable, procurement, treasury, governance teams, or any teams where you add or change uh, vendors through um, all the way through making payments to vendors, um, this really makes you susceptible to business email compromise um, or perhaps processing transactions for internal activities. Um, that makes you susceptible to gift card scams, both of which could require you to sign in the various sites to complete whatever transaction or process you're doing, um, thus leaving you open for a credential theft. And it's not easy for these team members, right? Um, it's not easy for you to ignore attachments or links. That's really your job, right? You receive banking um, and other vendor data via email to add or change a vendor. You receive um, emails from internal employees making requests for payments. You receive links and emails to log into a portal or download a, um, a, a utility bill or complete a payment. So the question now is what can you do to avoid email fraud? Um, but before we get there, I'm going to launch the one and only poll that we have um, in today's webinar. And let me go ahead and get that. Okay, and let me launch it. All right, so um, poll question. How many emails do you get in in a day. Um, and if you manage a generic email box like ap at yourcompany.com, you can respond with those volumes. Um, so is it 200 plus? Is it 100 to uh, 200? Is it 50 to 100? Or is it less than 50? So this is a quick poll. I'll give you about 15 more seconds to go ahead and answer that. Um, it's be, it would be very interesting to see what, uh, what volumes you guys are dealing with. All right, so about five more seconds, go ahead. It looks like we have over half has voted. So if you haven't voted, go ahead and get your vote in really quick and then I will share the poll. All right, so we're getting close. Um, more than 75%, I'm gonna go ahead and close it out. Thank you guys for voting. So let me close that. All right, so looks like we got 86% that um, voted. And so let's take a look at the results. So we have 43%, looks like the highest, um, have 50 to um, 100 emails per day. And then we have uh, 30%, 100 to 200 emails per day. And then 17% uh, have 200 or more per day. And then 10% have has less than 50. So the majority, 50 to 100. Oh, but that 200 or plus per day. Um, this this webinar really for everyone. Um, this webinar is for you because even if you're in the 10% with the less than 50%, it only takes that one email to uh, to uh, perpetrate fraud. So let me go ahead and close that, and then we will continue on with the um, webinar. All right, so now um, we're done with that piece and that brings us right to 20 tips to avoid email fraud in the vendor process, right? What you can do with those 15% or so of emails that, that get through your IT or security controls. All right, so let's go. All right, so tips to avoid business email compromise scams. And in a business email compromise or BEC scam, criminals um, can send an email message that appears to come from a known source um, making a legitimate request. Now, in the vendor process, this means that they're trying to make a request to change the banking or remit address, because it can be a check payment fraud as well, um, in order to divert vendor payments. So let's look at um, some tips to avoid that. All right, so the first thing I do wanna say is that no one, not even you, 
are ever going to be 100% to catch these emails every day, all day. Um, which we have already seen fraudsters are finding new ways all the time to get past our normal standbys of checking emails. So tip number one, and I think this is a very important uh, tip, is to have management um, to, to just avoid the expectation that you're going to get a request from management. Um, I worked for Verizon as an AP senior manager while Lowell McAdam was the CEO, and at no time did Lowell reach out to me and tell me to pay anyone. Um, so remove that expectation so that you or your team members do, um, so that if you receive an email from who you think is leadership to change banking or make that urgent payment, um, it's immediately seen as a red flag and not a moment to please, right? All right, so that's one. The second thing is, is authentication of the requester's um, whether it's your vendors or an internal employee contacting AP or submitting documents on the behalf of the vendor, and then also um, authentication of data. So for your requesters, um, again, be it the vendor or internal employee, think about this. When you call your bank, do they just talk to you about your account? No, they don't. They ask you two to three identifying questions to authenticate you are who you say you are, and you need to do the same thing with your vendors and your internal employees. So ask them two to three identifying questions like an invoice number and the last four digits of the existing bank account number, especially if they are an existing vendor trying to change your bank account. And the same thing with internal employees if they do not email from their company work mail. And we saw that a lot doing, during um, COVID. Not sure if you're still experiencing that or not. Um, but even then, even if they do email you from the company work mail, um, their email could have been hacked and the froster fraudster could have removed the external email indicator. So you don't really know who you are talking to. So ask them something like their cubicle or office number and maybe the next two level ups on their hierarchy. Um, the next thing is authenticating data if they're making changes. So now that you have authenticated the requester, use authenticating data to match against the existing vendor record data. Are they making a banking change? Then require the existing banking information. And if you get pushback, then you have to wonder that if they don't have the authority to provide the existing vendor data, um, vendor banking data, do they really have the authority to change it? Now, the next one is a, um, require a company branded ACH form and collect all that authenticated data that you're asking um, on a uh, company branded ACH form. You can still collect the voided check and the banking information on your vendor's letterhead or bank letterhead, although those can be forged. So instead of or also require a company branded ACH form and only give it to the vendors or internal employees to give to the vendors that actually authenticate change it every year and definitely do not put it on your website. That way, if you receive an older version from a vendor, right, it's a red flag because you know that you didn't just authenticate them. Otherwise, they would have the correct and updated version of the form. All right, the next one is the old standby, that confirmation phone call. And this one is really recommended anywhere you look, and it's not bad. Um, you confirm with the vendor using information already on the vendor record, not from the email request, and preferably with a contact that did not initiate re um, the request. But those that actually do this step, um, they know that it's, <clears throat> excuse me, much harder um, in practice um, because vendors don't always answer on that first call. So you need to track it, maintain a confirmation log, and capture the attempts. This can also be used to follow up on that second, third, uh, maybe the fourth call um, by other employees with the original um, team member. Um, or when the original team member that um, uh, that called is out, and it's
it's also great for management to track still pending requests before they exceed the stated turnaround times. Now, the last one is validate bank account ownership. You want to verify that the vendor legal name matches the bank account holder for that bank account account number. Now, there are a few different ways to do this. You can do a pre-note. However, not all banks will return the bank account holder name, so you really can't use that to verify against your vendor's legal name. Um, you can also do a micro deposit um, and have the vendor send a screenshot that includes the name and the deposit amount, um, but that can take a few days to complete. Um, you can also take advantage of third-party providers like Early Warning and GAIAC that can validate the ownership of the bank account by matching the vendor legal name against the bank account holder name for that bank account number. And they do that by using a database um, that U.S. banks contribute depositor uh, information to. And because of that, it's only available for U.S. banks or U.S. vendors that have or vendors that have U.S. banks. Um, and then there is a company called NS Knox that can do the same, except they have the vendor trigger a pre-note process, which means they can provide validation of bank account ownership for any bank, not just U.S. banks, but also non-U.S. banks um, as well. All right, so now if for some reason authentication does not work and it's still that froster still slips by, um, or maybe your team members are not following the authentication or, or the other steps, um, they're not following that process, you still need to add those internal controls and best practices to prevent that fraudulent payment. Um, and so the first one is least privilege access. So this is number six. Now this means not only giving access or um, only giving access to those that actually need to add vendors um, in the vendor master file or need to change existing vendor data. For everyone else, they don't need to have access to the vendor sensitive data, which is their bank account information and their tax ID. Could be their birth date if you're collecting it um, based on some country requirements, but they don't need access to that. Um, and if you think about it, how great it is that, you know, you're training your vendor team, you're attending this webinar, doing some other things to authenticate the vendors, to prevent fraud, but then the fraudsters turn around and contact Helpful Sally, right, in another department, and then she turns around with her access and gives them what they need to authenticate, right? So that's, a, that's an example of why you need to practice least privileged access. The next one is to mask sensitive information. Um, and before you say, but AP needs access, right, to the tax ID, to post the invoice, to the right vendor number. Um, and if they have a system like PeopleSoft, they need the bank account number to identify that they're um, using the right location. But you can only give them access um, to view the last four or five digits of the tax ID. That's enough to post an invoice and only give them the last four or five digits um, of the bank account number. That's enough to find the correct location to select for the payment. The next one is require management approval. This is um, more for comp uh, a compensation compensating control when there's a segregation of duties issue, but you can still use that and require management approval for new vendor ads and or existing vendor changes, but make sure they really look at it um, and not like you know, when they approve an expense report. Um, make sure the vendor team attaches the supporting documentation, Okay, someone just said that they couldn't hear. Let me go ahead and make sure that my audio, okay, my audio is going, so that must be um, that person. So you might wanna check your connection. Okay, so um, make sure, I'll keep going, make sure the vendor team attaches the supporting documentation, the validations and the email that requested the add or change so that the manager can um, review. Or if that is too much, 
review specific invoices prior to releasing payments. Say all invoices over $50,000, or if you're a large company, maybe you bump that up to $300,000 or $500,000. Um, and look at those um, that fit that threshold and that have also recently had a remittance change. Um, and so, and again, any remittance change, because it, it can still be a check payment um, fraud along with a um, uh, ACH fraud when they try to change the bank account. And then number 10 is to send a notification to the vendor. So the same way that Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, and your bank send you a notification every time a change is made to your record, send one to your vendors, even if it's just via mail because you don't have an email address on file, it can still be quicker than waiting on the vendor um, to wait to notice that their payment is missing. Then, um, and then call you when it's definitely too late to recover the funds. So you may be able to get a vendor to respond even before you generate the payment, saving you the hassle of the process to recover the funds. All right, the next one, let me go ahead, is tips to avoid gift card scams. So gift card scams are when someone asks you to pay for something that um, by putting money on the gift card, like Amazon, Google, Google Play or iTunes card, and then ask you to give them the numbers on the back of the card. So let's take a look at some tips to avoid um, this. And it's really funny is that, right, we buy gift cards even for um, our internal team members or for our, our, uh, our company buys gift cards because they're easy. Um, and if you think about it, they're easy for fraudsters too. And so the number 11, the tip for um, avoiding gift card scams, so the first one is, again, management avoid expectations. So just like business email compromise, avoid the expectation that it's even possible that management will contact an employee for gift cards. Um, why have the employees spend petty cash if you still have it or even their own money for a gift card? Again, the expectation itself should be a red flag. The next thing is gift cards are for gifts, not payments. You may get a call from the IRS or utility company um, saying you have to pay taxes or a fine or threaten to cut off your company's utilities. Um, gift cards are for payments, so this request should be a red flag. Now, if you have to buy gift cards, make sure you use trusted merchants. Stick to stores you know and trust. Avoid buying from online auction sites because the gift cards may be fake or stolen. And check it out before you buy it. Um, make sure the protective stickers, if you're in a physical store, make sure that they're on the card and that they do not appear to be tampered with. Also check that the PIN number on the back isn't showing and get a different card if you spot a problem. Now, if you have been scammed, tip number 15 is if you've been scammed, you paid a scammer with a gift card, tell the company that issued the card right away. When, when you contact the company, tell them the gift card was used in a scam and ask them if they can refund your money. If you act quickly enough, the company might be able to get your money back. Also, tell the store where you bought the gift card as soon as possible. And now moving on to tips to avoid credential theft. So credential theft is just that. Cyber criminals find a way to get you to enter your credentials into a fake or phishing site with the intent to reuse your login information to access and then abuse or, or uh, exfiltrate critical data and information. All right, so tip number 16. Um, oh, first I do wanna say that in a 2017 study, um, it found that the average person is likely to have 100 passwords 100 plus passwords. So you likely have 100 plus passwords to remember. Um, and as a result of that, they are reused and the cyber criminals love this. So tip number 16 is a password manager. So use password managers to remember all your different passwords so you don't have to. Um, if you get a link to a website that you need to log into, 
don't click from the link, rather launch it from the password manager um, uh, versus clicking that link in the email. Plus, if you land on a site and it auto fields, it's credible um, that it's your, it's probable that it's your actual site and not a spoofed website. Now, if you don't know if your company allows it, um, have that conversation with your IT or security team or leadership. The next tip, number 17, is who is .net. So if you are suspicious, copy and paste, not type, but copy and paste the email domain into the search field of who is .net. The results will be information on this website, including the date registered. So if apple.com has a capital I for the L and comes back with a recent date registered, that is a red flag that you are dealing with a phishing site. Um, the next one, number 18, is multi-factor authentication. So I know much has been written around about how to get around MFA, but it is still an additional layer of evidence that could prove that the cyber criminal is not you, so turn it on wherever it's available. The next tip, number 19, is public email address. So don't use your company email for personal business. Don't use your personal email for company business. Also, don't use your personal email for public business. Get a public email address to register on public forums, chat rooms, or subscribe to mailing lists. And don't be afraid to change it often. If you use several public email addresses for specific purposes, you have a better chance of identifying which services may be selling your address to spammers. And then the last one, number 20, is to share and report. Don't forward the email, but share the email in a screenshot with your colleagues, because fraudsters tend to send the same email to multiple employees at the same company, and those other employees may not have gotten to it in their inbox yet. And then once you share it, make sure you report it. Follow your company policy, which is hopefully, um, which hopefully includes reporting it to the proper authorities, such as the FBI or the IRS, if it's a tax related scam. And then lastly, I do want to say on that note, here are some resources to find new scams and trends and share this with your team members as well. You can even subscribe to my new scam alert so you're always notified when I post them on my site which since 2020 has been about two to three per week and sometimes more. Um, all of those ways that I talked about cyber criminals evolving at the beginning of the webinar were scam alerts on my site, so make sure you sign up. Whew. All right, so that's it. Um, we've got about three minutes left. And so um, I do want to, before we get to q and I do want to um, uh, show you how to connect with me, especially on YouTube, where I have a weekly vendor master file tip of the week. So be sure um, to subscribe. I also have a weekly podcast. Um, episode 155 will be published tomorrow. Um, and it's talk, it talks about validations, uh, eight different validations validations um, that you can um, do just using the information from the IRS W-9. Um, and then, so make sure you, uh, you listen to that on whatever platform you listen to for podcasts because it's everywhere. Also, connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, my favorite day of the week is Monday. So you can follow my TGIM post <laughs> with AP Humor on Mondays. And we have a couple minutes left for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and um, put them in the question section. If you uh, think of questions afterwards, you can email them to info at DeborahRRichardson.com. Uh, um, but again, I will be on here for, um, we've got about another um, minute left. So if you have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the question section. All right, so I don't see any questions. Um, we've got about another uh, 30 seconds or so in the webinar. I'm just checking here. Make sure I'll check the chat area as well. Yep, I don't see anything in chat. 
So I did have a question about copies of the slides. Yes, um, you can actually download um, a copy of the slides from the handout section. And if for some reason you are unable to download it from the handout section, you can, um, uh, there will be a link in the email that I send you um, to listen to the recording. There will also be a link to where you can go to download the handouts. All right. Okay, great. I'm glad you see them. All right, great. All right, so we are right at the top of the hour or at the half an hour. So I want to thank everyone for attending. Again, if you see or if you um, think of any questions afterwards, feel free to send those to info at DeborahRichardson.com and I will um, respond to them within 24 hours. So thanks everyone. I'm very glad you were able to attend. This webinar has now concluded.